Uh, today, we're starting a new worship series that's going to carry us through the season of Lent and on into the celebration of Easter. Uh, and as we start the series, I just want to say a word uh, about uh, where it's come from. Um, I found this series uh, as we were in the middle of our previous series, the, uh, the Half-Truth series, that was based on a book written by Adam Hamilton. Uh, Adam is the pastor of Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, uh, and they've got this remarkable resource at their church called Share Church. Uh, church of the Resurrection is a large church, one of those mega churches with thousands of uh, members and, and, and dozens of staff, and they do really, really great and creative work. One of the things they're offering to other churches that may not have those same resources um, is to take what they've put together uh, and use it in a way uh, that can help us experience um, some of the things that they're doing that are really, really working. And the nice thing is, is, is they do that just out of the generosity of their hearts. Uh, while I was combing through that uh, website, I came across this series called The Gospel of Nobodies, and I started listening, and basically I was so drawn in that, that I binged the series like you would binge Netflix. I, I, just, I could not stop. I was so taken uh, by what they were saying as a staff, and there's multiple people who preach that series. is so very, very good. Um, and whenever I hear something like that, that, that that just is so great, that's just so well done, I don't care where it comes from, I want to share it with you because uh, I want you to at least get a taste, and though we'll make it our own and do some things on our own to make it unique to us, um, it's so well done. Uh, one of the things that they did that's going to be helpful to us in our journey is they've given us some resources that I want to encourage you to, to, uh, to make use of. Uh, the first is, uh, is a bookmark. It, it was found, it's in the bulletins today. If you didn't get one on the way in, please feel free to grab one on the way out. Let me tell you a little bit about the bookmark. Um, it's divided up into daily reading starting tomorrow. Uh, and so as you read through uh, each of these readings, it'll take just a few minutes each day. Uh, but if you read through these and, and keep up with it, you'll follow along with the sermons that are preached, the messages that are given, and you'll get all the way through the Gospel of Luke uh, uh, the, last, the week following Easter. The second thing that we've done is we've taken what they call their GPS guide, their Grow, Pray, and Study guide. And it's, it's a tremendous resource. Uh, we put it on the sermon page, which you can get on the app or on our website. And what it is, is it takes each of these daily readings, lets you know what they are, so you can actually have the reading schedule if you, if you lose your bookmark. Uh, but more than just give you the readings, it gives you a daily devotion to go with the readings. Um, so some, back, some uh, background information into the reading, some additional things to think about. Uh, for those of you with young children in your household, it's got some family activities that you might want to use. Very, very well done. And I really want to encourage you uh, to make use of it. Um, Lent is a time that's uh, meant to include increased study and prayer, uh, and so this is a way that, that we can help you do that. Um, so what's going to happen here is we're going to focus on the Gospel of Luke, uh, and uh, I've got to confess that the Gospel of Luke uh, is my favorite gospel. Uh, don't tell Matthew, Mark, and John. I know that we're supposed to love all of our children equally, um, and all the Gospels are equal, uh, but th this is the greatest of the equals for me. Uh, and part of the reason that I love Luke so much is because Luke is the Gospel that helped me really fall in love with the story of Jesus Christ. And, and the way that that happened is that while all of the Gospels tell the story of the radical love of Jesus Christ and, and how he shows such grace to everyone that he encounters, the Gospel of Luke does it in such a way that is so profound and so powerful, it just kind of broke my heart open uh, for the grace of Jesus Christ. Because in the Gospel of Luke, what we're going to discover together and what you may already know about the Gospel of Luke is that the Gospel of Luke is a message for those who the world wasn't seeing at that time, for the outcast, for the forgotten, for the sick and demon-possessed, for those that the world didn't see as having any value, those that others might refer to as being nobodies. In so many ways, the gospel of Luke is the gospel of the nobodies. Because it lets those who feel like they're invisible, forgotten, alone, it lets them know that they're not, that they matter, and that God loves them so much that God came to live among them, to love them and teach them, and even die for them. This is an amazing gospel of amazing grace. And it's so fitting that as we get ready to tell the story of the, of the greatest grace ever shown through the resurrection of Christ, that we follow this journey uh, on the way. Now, just because this is a gospel that's, that's, really, that's really focused on those who feel on the outside, the nobodies of the story, it, it's also a story for those who find themselves in a place of being somebody, at least in the way that the world might consider someone to be somebody. Uh, and if we've got homes that we can go to and clothes and food and, and jobs and family, 
um, according to the ways of this world, while we may not see ourselves as somebody, we're a lot more somebody than others. And I think it's important for us to recognize that, that we've got resources that God may be calling us to use um, so that we can leverage that in a way that helps the nobodies out there, those who are struggling and in the margins know um, that they are loved by God. So we're going to start the journey uh, with the beginning of the story. And, and I know that we tell the beginning of the story of Jesus' life every year at Christmas time, uh, but I want to start there today because the, the story of Jesus' birth that's told in the opening chapters of Luke sets the stage for the rest of the gospel. It's crucially important that we understand the purpose of the story of Jesus' birth according to the gospel of Luke. And, and I want to start with a map. Uh, and again, I, I, if you're like me, uh, this looks vaguely like the, like, you know, like the Holy Lands, but you can't really see what's on there. And so all of God's people said amen, and we zoom in a little bit so that you can see it a little bit more closely. I just wanted you to get an overall sense of where we were first. Uh, and, and I want to point out two cities on the map. That, that the first one, I imagine, is pretty familiar to you, uh, and that's Nazareth. And so here's Nazareth right here. Uh, but before we talk about Nazareth, I want to talk about this city, which is Sepphoris. Um, both Sepphoris and Nazareth were in the region of the Galilee. Sepphoris was about three or four miles away from Nazareth, and, and Sepphoris was considered by many um, to be the jewel of the Galilee. It was the center of education and higher learning. It was the center of wealth and power. It was the center of culture. Anybody who was somebody who lived in the Galilee either lived in Sepphoris or wanted to live in Sepphoris. It was the place to be. On the other hand, Nazareth, which was a much smaller city, it really wasn't even a city, it was just a, a village or a town, um, it was very poor. And the people who lived there were uneducated, and they primarily served as domestic workers. They, they were the domestic workers for the somebodies in Sepphoris. So they would walk three or four miles a day, they would go to work, and they would serve others in, in pretty low-level jobs. Uh, and then at the end of the day, they would come back uh, to, their, uh, ta to their hometown uh, where they lived. Now, Nazareth did not have a good reputation at all. Uh, in fact, you may remember the story when Philip told Nathaniel that they had found the Messiah. Uh, Philip said, we found him, and he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, Nazareth? Has anything good ever come from Nazareth? I mean, this was a nowhere town filled with nobody people that no one paid any attention to um, in, in those days. Uh, and, and really, that's an important thing for us to remember because it's starting to tell the story about how God wants to enter this world. Now, living in Nazareth at that time was a young woman. Her name was Mary. Uh, she was unwed. She was young, probably a teenager. She was uneducated. And odds are she was going to live her life as a domestic servant for those who lived in Sepphoris because that's what young women did. Um, they, they served as domestics in Sepphoris. They took care of the somebodies. And so that's probably what she expected uh, her life to be. If anyone encountered Mary or saw Mary, if they even noticed her or paid attention to her, um, she would most likely be seen, have been seen as beneath them, a nobody, an outsider. So God tells the angel Gabriel to go to this uneducated young woman in this nowhere town to tell her that God has chosen her for the most important job in human history, to conceive and carry and give birth, and along with her fiancé Joseph, to raise the very Son of God. God in, in the flesh in human form. Now, when Mary first hears, hears this, of course, she's shocked and, and, and trying to figure it all out and probably overwhelmed because uh, who is God to come and do this through me? I'm, I'm a nobody. Uh, when, when, the, when the pregnancy becomes fully known to her and she realizes that, yes, indeed, this is happening, just as the angel uh, foretold, uh, she writes a song, and it's found in the first chapter of, of Luke. It's often referred to as Mary's Magnificat. Uh, Mary's song, and it's, it's powerful all the way through, uh, but I want to share with you just a couple of verses from it, because it lets you see what was going on in the mind of Mary uh, as she's sorting through what this, story, um, what this story says to her and what it means to her. 
My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. So so right off the bat, Mary is recognizing that she is a servant, that she is lowly, and yet the Most High God is looking on her with favor. She continues, He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. She is telling the story of the reality that God is breaking into the world and turning everything that she's ever known upside down. The rich, the wealthy, the powerful somebodies who never even noticed her and perhaps took advantage of her, she certainly served at their pleasure. All of a sudden, she recognizes that she's being elevated to an incredibly high position. She is being filled with good things, and in comparison to the things that God is giving her, even the most powerful are going to feel hungry in comparison. Everything is being turned upside down. She's starting to see she's not just a nobody in God's eyes. In the ninth month of Mary's pregnancy, she and her fiancé Joseph, they've got to go to Bethlehem to be registered for the census. Uh, Bethlehem is about 80 miles from Nazareth uh, to the south. The journey is treacherous, it's dangerous, and it's hard. Again, she is in her ninth month of pregnancy, and the bulk of this journey has to take place by, on foot. There's no planes, trains, and automobiles getting people where they need to be. I want you to imagine being nine months pregnant and setting out on an 80-mile journey through treacherous locations, um, harsh locations, and traveling by foot. It's very hard. So, so they finally, after some time, they finally get to Bethlehem, and when they get there, they're exhausted, they're tired, they're overwhelmed. But the Scripture tells us that there were no available guest rooms. They could not find any guest rooms. I know we often say there was no room at the inn. There, there were no Motel 6s or anything like that. It, it didn't work that way. They had guest rooms. And, and you could go and stay in people's guest rooms that were in their homes. There, there just were no guest rooms. They were all full because everybody was there for the census. And so what happened was without anywhere else to go, they ended up um, basically in a stable. But the stable might not be what you're thinking about. Uh, houses back in that time, in that area, were built uh, on kind of on rock, and, and they, they, they were multi-level. The bottom level was usually dug into the ground. It was underground. It was more like a cave than, than a stable than, that you and I might, um, might imagine. So it was more like a cave. It was underground. It was the bottom level of the floor of the, of the home, and that's where the animals, where the livestock were kept. Uh, it, this is an image of, of um, one of those, of, of a room like that. This isn't, I'm not suggesting this is the room where Jesus was born. Um, but it was a room like this, uh, under the house, uh, the, literally the lowest level of living. So this is where they've gone to find shelter. Um, they're not alone. Uh, there are animals and livestock that are in the room with them. Um, I'm sure that you know what animals and livestock do, uh, whether they're inside or outside, right? Um, this would be considered to be a dirty unclean place to be. Perhaps better than being outside, but, but certainly a very, very lowly place to be. This is how nobodies entered the world. In, in the bottom floor of a house where the animals made their home. So now we've got the, we've got the most powerful force in all of created history choosing to come into the world in the most lowly manner possible through a young girl from a nowhere town finding her way to Bethlehem with nowhere to stay, giving birth to her son in a stable surrounded by animals. No one would have expected this. No one could have seen this coming. This is not how anyone thought it would be done. I've often wondered if this story were to play itself out in the modern world, if God were to decide to come into the world again in the same way and tell the same story that God did around the birth of Jesus, um, where would Jesus be born? Into what family? 
from what nowhere town and what no place country? Where would it be that, that God would make God's entry in order to, to tell us this same story? Um, there uh, was a, a, a cartoonist, an animator named Everett Patterson, and, and he was attending a church where they were asking the same question. Like, what would you imagine it to be? Where would that place be? Um, and he decided he would answer it. And uh, the first thing that he decided was that he was going to draw an animation of it, a cartoon of it, um, and that he knew this to be sure, that the family he was going to draw was not going to be a middle-class white European family. He, he wanted to break out of that norm uh, because that would likely be the, be the way in which Jesus would come because we're, that's usually representative of the somebodies. Uh, so what he did was he, painted, he, he drew a picture called uh, Jose y Maria. And, and again, I know it's kind of hard to see up there because the, because it's in portrait uh, and not landscape. We've put it on the, on the sermon page so you can go and look at it a little bit closer because he's taken such great pains. Almost the whole birth narrative is told in little images and, and, and little things that he's put in there, scripture passages and all kinds of things. It's really uh, a very, very well done and thought-provoking piece. Um, but it's a piece where we see the Holy Family as a couple that if we were to encounter on our way into the store to grab something on the way home for dinner, we might not even notice them. We might not even see them. And if we saw them, in spite of ourselves, our implicit bias might kick in and, and we might think something that isn't necessarily true of them. And that was the purpose of, of Patterson's drawing. He wanted us to, to be pulled in a way that forced us to think. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that this is the way the Holy Family would look if, if, if God came into the world um, in human form today. Um, but I, I think it might be something like that. The least expected, somebody that we might see as nobody, a, a family from a nowhere town, all those kinds of things that might cause us to wonder if it's even true. Because that's what happened. As the story was starting to be told about Jesus and how he came into the world, the somebodies were here in this story, and they were like, there is no way that God would enter in the world this way. Are you kidding me? A, a, a young domestic from Nazareth, born in a stable in Bethlehem, surrounded by animals? There, there's no way that God came into the world that way. And many people didn't believe because that's the way that, that Jesus chose to come. I wonder if Jesus chose to come in a way today that was outside the norms that we might expect. Would we believe it? Would we press back? Would we know that it was possible for Jesus, the greatest somebody in human history, to come through what we might consider to be a nowhere path? You see what's happening here. Sometimes we view this story as a quaint, warm holiday story that, that, we, that we recreate every year around Christmas, and it's good that we do that. It is a warm, quaint, touching story. But in the midst of that warmth and in the midst of that familiarity, we've got to remember that this is a revolution of God's grace that is happening here. This is God breaking into the world and turning the social structure upside down. This is God proclaiming a very clear message to everyone who will listen. You matter. I don't care what the world says about you. You've been made in my image. And you're somebody. Not too far away from where the baby had been born, there were some shepherds. And they were keeping watch over their flock at night. And we've talked about the shepherds before. Uh, shepherds in that day and age, they talk about nobodies. I mean, they were at the bottom of the ladder of society. In fact, they weren't even on the bottom rung. Uh, they were so distrusted by society, it was against the law for them to testify in court. Uh, they were dirty, they were smelly, they were shiftless, they were everything that we would imagine to be someone we didn't want to be or be anywhere near us, right? Now, um, even though that they were the lowest of the low as a whole group, even within the profession of shepherding, um, there was a pecking order. And guess who was at the bottom of the pecking order of the shepherds? The night shift workers. The night shift shepherds. So even amongst the lowest of the low, the lowest of those low, the nobodies of the nobodies out in the fields were the night shift shepherds. So these night shift shepherds are out there and they're, they're on a hill and, and an angel comes and appears to them and says, hey, I have some great news. A baby's been born and he's been wrapped in cloth and he's 
laying in a manger, and this is good news for all of God's people. I want you to go, and I want you to greet and meet the baby. Now, it's important to remind ourselves here that while when we set up a, a nativity set in our homes or in church or, or wherever we may set them up, we, we include the, the magi in that scene, the magi were not there on the night that Jesus was born. It, it was at least days, if not some time, before uh, they come onto the scene. So the night when Jesus was born, it's Mary and Joseph, and it's some night shift shepherds. I want you to think about something for just a moment. If you've uh, ever given birth to a child or if you've ever been present for the birth of a child, who's in the room? Who gets to be in the room when your baby is born? When do you get to be in the room when someone else's baby is born? The most important people in our lives, right? The people we love and treasure the most, the people we trust the most. That's who we want there. The first person we want to hold our children is someone that we know loves them more than anything in the world, right? And if you've been there when someone else has given birth and you're standing in the room and the baby's there and mom or dad says, hey, you want to hold my son? You want to hold my daughter? And you get to take the baby and you hold it. That's amazing that they've trusted you with the life that they've been granted in the form of this infant, right? This is among the most sacred moments in the human experience. And if you're in that room, you're somebody. You wouldn't be there. So Jesus comes into the world. God comes into the world and he's born in a stable. And who did God invite to be there? Who held the baby for the first time beyond Mary and Joseph? Night shift shepherds. God found them on the hillside and God said, you, you are the ones that I want to be there because you're so important to this story. You matter so much to this story that you've got to be right there. You've got to be the first one to hold the baby. See what's happening here? Jesus isn't just telling us some cute holiday story. The, the gospel is telling us this groundbreaking, earth-shattering story where the nobodies suddenly find themselves central to the narrative. They matter. They count. Imagine what that felt like for the shepherds. Imagine what it felt like for Mary and Joseph. Imagine what it felt like for all the nobodies in the ancient world, the sick, the dying, the lame, the outcast, all the demon-possessed. Imagine what it was like for all of them as they start hearing this story for the first time. Really? Shepherds? God's son? In a stable? That, that's how God... They, they start to recognize that, that this story is their story. There, there's a moment um, in the story of Jesus where he encounters this nobody named Zacchaeus who's a tax collector. Yes, he's got power, he's got privilege, he's got all that stuff, but, but everybody hates him, he's distrusted, they don't like him, he's a nobody. Jesus meets him, goes to his home, spends some time with him, shows him how much he cares for him and loves him. And as part of the story, Jesus says to those who are around, I came to seek and save the lost. <clears throat> Have you ever heard that passage? I came to seek and save the lost. Often when we think of that passage, we think of people um, maybe going around downtown holding up uh, uh, tracts or standing on the street corner at the very least asking us that familiar question, have you been saved? Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And if you haven't repented of your sins and, and taken Jesus into your life and been baptized, then you're lost and you need to be saved. Jesus came to seek and save you. Now, I'm not diminishing that there isn't any truth to that. I'm not saying there isn't. But I wonder if maybe we've missed the point of what Jesus was saying here because the context in which it was said. Maybe, just maybe, when Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost, he wasn't talking about some kind of morality or baptism or being saved for eternal life. Maybe when Jesus came to talk about seeking and saving the lost, Jesus meant more than that. Jesus meant the people who were dispossessed, outside, forgotten, those nobodies who nobody else was paying attention to. 
Maybe Jesus said, I came to seek and save the demon-possessed, those filled with leprosy, the adulterers, the prostitutes, the thieves, the tax collectors, the ones that you won't even let into your house of worship. They are so lost that they are dying spiritually out there and you won't let them come and find God. I've come to seek and save them through my love and my grace and I'm going to do everything I can to find them and bring them home. Maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said, I came to seek and save the lost. And if that's what Jesus meant, maybe that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Not to just preach Christianity as some kind of moral relativism that we've got to get just right in order for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus is saying, you need to go out there and seek and save the lost. You need to find the nobodies who live in the shadow, who feel like they don't matter, who feel like they're invisible to the world. You've got to crawl up underneath highway bridges and you've got to go to homeless camps and you've got to get in prisons and hospitals and you've got to go to bars and brothels and you've got to get everywhere you can go where you can find someone who is living in the shadows, who think they don't matter, that they're a nobody, and that the world doesn't care for them, and you need to let them know that they are loved and they are somebody because they are my child. That's the story of the Gospel of Luke. That's the story of how Jesus came into this world, not through the somebodies, but through the lowest of the low, the nobody. We must never forget that if we're to understand what this message of hope is about. If you've ever felt lost and alone, invisible, and placed on the outside for whatever reason, I hope you'll know without a shadow of a doubt that you're not a nobody. You're a somebody. And you're deeply loved. And you're seen. And you matter. If you're a somebody, I hope you know that there's someone out there who feels lost and afraid and alone and they need somebody to see them, to love them, and to let them know what it looks like to come home. May we as a people, as we take this journey toward Easter, proclaim the good news, seek and save the lost, and know that we are all somebody. Amen.